Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Southwestern Energy stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Southwestern Energy is a natural gas exploration and production company. The company is headquartered in Spring, Texas and was founded in 1929. It went public in 1980 and trades on the New York Stock Exchange and Deutsche Börse. The company's main exploration and production activities are in the Appalachian Basin in Pennsylvania and West Virginia. The company also controls 2.5 million undeveloped acres in New Brunswick, Canada, which cannot be developed at this time, but possibly in the future. It has 12 trillion cubic feet of natural gas equivalent approved reserves, of which 68% is natural gas, 29% is natural gas liquids, and 3% petroleum, all in the Appalachian Basin. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, 3.4 billion market cap. They're trading at $5 a share, and they have 677 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future, and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see they have negative free cash flow each year because they're investing a lot of money back into their business through capital expenditures. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that's positive in 2018 and 19, negative in 2020. Revenue is the sales for the company. And that drops a lot from 2018 to 2020 but it does jump a little bit in the trailing 12 months. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. And the difference between those two numbers is their gross profit. They had their highest gross profit in 2018 at over $2 billion. Below that is operating expenses. Then below that is operating income and their operating income peaked in 2018 at almost $1 billion. It is $325 million in the trailing 12 months. They only had $16 million of operating income in 2020. That's due to lower revenue from COVID and lower oil prices. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt. They paid $124 million of interest in 2018. They paid $106 million in the trailing 12 months. Then below that is other income and expenses. And that's why they have such negative net income in 2020 in a trailing 12 months was this big negative in other income and expenses. They had $2.8 billion of write-offs in 2020, $1.4 billion in a trailing 12 months. When you write off an asset on your balance sheet, you have to pass through the loss onto your income statement. That's a non-cash item, so it doesn't affect cash flow, but it makes your net income look bad. So their net income was a big negative in a trailing 12 months and 2020. They did have positive in 2018 and 19. When you look at the income statement, you should focus on operating income because net income can be really volatile with other income and expenses. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. So you can see they have positive operating income each year. The reason they had negative net income in 2020 and the trailing 12 months was those large write-offs plus other non-cash expenses like depreciation. Then you have capital expenditures which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. This company is investing a lot back into their business. They invested over $1 billion in 2018 and 19 and $900 million in 2020. The idea is the investment in CapEx will grow the business and give them more free cash flow in the future. So they do have negative free cash flow each year because they're investing so much in CapEx. They must have had a lot of cash on their balance sheet because they had negative free cash flow and in 2018, 19, and 20, they paid down a lot of debt. In 2018 alone, they issued $2 billion of debt and paid down $4 billion. So they decreased their debt load over $2 billion in 2018. And in 2019 and 20, they issued a similar amount of debt as they paid off. They bought back 180 million of capital stock in 2018 and 21 million in 2019. 
but they issued 152 million of capital stock in 2020. Let's look at the capital structure. 586 million of equity, 3.2 billion of debt. Their 16% equity, 84% debt. And their WAC is 8.5%, and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's 5.9 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $4.8 billion. We divide that by 677 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $7. They're trading at $5, so they're trading at a 28% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street is higher than me. They're at $12 a share, so they're saying the stock is 58% undervalued. Nine analysts priced this stock, and the average price target was $5.17. The low was $4, the high was $6.80. This is a stock price since it started trading, and it looks like it was pretty flat for a really long time. And then around 2003, the stock really shot up, over $50 a share. Then it came crashing down, and it looks like it's been up and down. It seems to be at a low point overall. This bottom chart is a stock price to last year, so it looks like it's done pretty well the past 12 months. Overall, it's increasing. There were dips here and there, but if you held on, you could have made a decent return. They have a beta of 1.51, so the stock moves one and a half times the market. It's a little volatile. The stock has gone up 74% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P 500 went up 41%. The 52-week low was 218, the high was 518. And the stock is trading above its 50-day and 200-day moving average, so it seems to be on an uptrend. This is a pretty liquid stock. 14 million to 16 million shares are traded each day. Of the 677 million shares outstanding, 668 million are on float. 90% are held by institutions, and over 9% of the shares on float are shorted. In the past year, this stock has done well, up 88%, while its industry is up 58%, and the market is up 53%. But in the past three years, this stock is only up 12%, which is better than its industry, down 16%, but much worse than the market, which is up 62%. But in the past five years, this stock has really struggled, down 57%. Its industry is up only 3%, but the market is up 126%. Analysts are forecasting their earnings to grow 18%, its industry 16%, and the market 15%. Analysts are forecasting their revenue to grow 3%, its industry 4%, and the market 9%. In the past five years, their annual earnings increased 27%, its industry 4%, and the market 12%. In the last year, their earnings decreased 20%, its industry is even worse, decreasing 41%, and the market increasing 19%. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, your investment would have been down to $1,200 today. That's an 88% loss. The biggest shareholder is BlackRock at 16%, then FMR, Vanguard, State Street, and Dimensional Fund. Let's look at their financial ratios. The average PE in the market is 33, the median is 22. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They have negative net income, so we can't look at the PE. Their price to sales is 1.2, so investors are paying $1.20 for $1 revenue. That's a really good ratio, much better than the market median and average. Price to book is 5.9, which is between the median and average. Their return on invested capital is 6.9%, interest coverage ratio 3.1, and they have a negative ROE since they have negative net income. Their current ratio is 0.4, so they can only cover 40% of their current liabilities with their current assets. And their current assets are 400 million of receivables and 157 million of hedging assets. They seem to be undercapitalized. They had negative 180 million of free cash flow, negative 768 million of working capital, so they're short $948 million. They're going to probably need more debt financing to run their business over the next 12 months. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of 15 companies in the same industry as Southwestern. And if Southwestern has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So they're pretty much worse in every single category, except price to sales ratio. They're doing really well in that category. They just need to do a better job at converting their sales to profit. 
But if you look at their 2020 income statement and you strip out the write-off, then their net income will be a lot better and possibly positive instead of negative. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 28% discount. This company has been around a really long time, so I don't think they're going anywhere. They've been investing a lot into their business through capital expenditures. So they should be generating positive free cash flow pretty soon. I rank their free cash flow as 1 out of 10, their revenue 3 out of 10, and their ratios 2 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.